Well, if you would open in your Bibles um, to Genesis chapter 2, and we're going to look at the first three verses tonight. That's as far as we're going. Now, some of you made note that I had quickly read through the last few verses of Genesis 1, and the reason is, is that is just sort of a statement, and the more detailed look will be at the, in the rest of of Genesis 2. So next time, next week we're together, we'll be looking at verse 4 to the end of the chapter, looking specifically how God created Adam and Eve, and uh, the whole story there that is not at all uh, in the general overview of chapter 1, but it gets into very specifics. So it's really hard because, I mean, you're looking at the end of that chapter 1, those verses are some of the greatest verses to teach the Trinity on really out of chapter one. So I want to do a study on the Trinity. Uh, and then here on the Sabbath, this is such an important topic. And I, I find often even old Christians are mixed up and have heard things and um, that are a little confusing on the Sabbath. So I, I, I want to teach a, a teaching and make it abundantly clear uh, what is the Sabbath and what it is not. And so in chapter 2, verse 1, thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were, notice this now, finished. Verse 2, and on the seventh day, God ended his work, notice, ended his work, which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Verse 3, then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because he had rested from all his work, which he had created, past tense, and made, past tense. So notice in verse 1, he finished. Verse 2, he ended. It was done. It was done. And then verse 3, it was created. It was made. It is an extreme amount of words to make it clear that nothing more was created, and nor would there be anything else created. Now, what's interesting about this is that is exactly what the first law of thermodynamics says uh, that Einstein discovered. These aren't theories like evolution. This is facts. And, and that is, he proves in that first law of thermodynamics that all that is created is created. And all that's created cannot go away. It stays here. And nothing new can be created. And it's not just earth, but the entire universe. Powerful that he learned that as a scientific law. Thermo, heat, dynamics, the dynamics of heat. The second law of thermodynamics is that the usable energy that does exist is being used up, is being burnt out. Just like time. Time is happening. It's, it's going. There had to be a starting point. The fact that the second law of thermodynamics says everything's winding down says there was a point things were wound up as winded up as it's going to go. And once you started the, started the unwinding process, we see it now consistently. This unwinding process isn't a bunch of unwinding, says for a while, a bunch of unwinding. No, it is like the ticking of a clock itself. Just like the ticking of time, it's very consistent, it's very knowable. In the same way, um, the usable energy we're using up, it's happening, uh, whether it's the burning out of the sun or a number of other things. But either way, it, it's, it's pretty amazing um, that, that the Bible's not a scientific book, but you will never find the Bible contradicting the laws or the truth, uh, the truthful facts of science. But we see here that, that God created one more seven days, the seventh day. The word seven, or the number seven in the Bible, and it's true in creation, is a completion. And eight is the number of new beginnings that starts things over. Whether you're looking at the notes on the scale, you get seven notes, and then the eight starts another scale. The eight starts another scale. And it could go into infinity that way. It could go infinity that way. Um, and, uh, and so we, we see it all through the Bible, groups of sevens. And whether it's the seventh year of the Sabbath rest or seven sevens, 
the 49th year, the year of Jubilee comes when everything is, when it goes back, all debts are forgiven, everybody goes back. And uh, of course, um, the eighth day <laughs> is when Christ rose again, completing the sevens, if you would. And he has started a brand new kingdom. And uh, so again here, the seventh day, God created a day. And this is a day in which he rested. Now, Isaiah 40 makes it clear God doesn't get tired. He neither slumbers nor sleeps. But yet he rested. And we're going to find out here in a minute in, in Exodus 31 that he refreshed himself on that day. And so was man to do it there afterwards. Well, you guys know the law, right? Exodus 20, it says, remember the Sabbath day there in verse 8 of Exodus 20. And keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. Uh, but on the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. You nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who was within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that's in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the seventh day and hollowed it, or made it holy. Now we are going to discover that this law is only for the children of Israel. So there is a sense that it is a law of creation of nature. And if you will understand how God created things and, and lean into that, you'll find a blessing. So I, I definitely believe, not for religious sake, to be right with God or to break one of his laws, but definitely the seventh day is part of creation and, and you should rest in a 24-hour period. There's evening and there's morning and a new day. And... Uh, there's been some amazing studies on this. The, the Seventh-day Adventists, um, they have pretty much become a denomination of doctors and hospitals all around the world. Uh, that's virtually the medical schools and all that. That's their expertise as a religion. Uh, it's just the way it sort of worked out. But they've done some amazing studies on uh, people that rest and how many hours they work, how many days they work, and... And they, they have proven um, there are just so many levels of healing and strength you can get from an entire day of rest. And uh, they, they, they had done some studies where they had people work seven days and they had another group of people doing the same thing, working six days and taking an entire day of rest and the people that worked seven days did not produce more, but less than those who worked six days and took a day of rest. They actually produced more. They have a lot of studies like that that are interesting. But I can't imagine the psychological, the physical, the relational, the emotional things that can happen. If you can, by faith, say, God, I'm doing this to honor you, not because I'm being righteous, I'm keeping the law, but just because I understand the way you created things. And, uh, and I'm going to lean into that and, and take the advantage of your wisdom in, in following the way you created all things. But in Exodus 31, he makes it abundantly clear that as a law, it's only to the Jewish people. That is an actual law that if it's broken, he goes on in, verse, in Exodus 31, verse 12 to 17. Boy, if you break the law, you are put to death. You are cut off. The word, when it says something's cut off, he's saying not only are you dead to earth, but you're dead to heaven. You're going to hell. And here it was, I mean, we, we know the first time this was practically worked. A guy was just picking up a few little branches to throw on the fire. But you don't start a fire on the Sabbath day. And, uh, and so they stoned him to death. You guys remember that. So again, when groups like the Seventh-day Adventists, and there's others as a Seventh-day Baptist and a few others, it's sort of strange to me that out of the 613 laws that they only keep that one. And then they don't really keep it 
because they don't stone anybody to death for not working or for working on that day. And uh, of course, exactly what the Jews did is then they started enacting ordinances. And that's what you see here in, in Exodus 31. They start, they start adding ordinances. Okay, I, I think work is starting a fire. I, I think work is cooking. I think work is walking X amount of distance. But of course, then you get cars. <laughs> and, and all I'm doing is pushing a button or turning a key, but yet the, it's a combustible engine. So I am starting a fire. So it's that, you know, one girl, oh yeah, that's, you know, well, the car's starting the fire, not you. And so now they, they cook stuff, but they have it all on timers. If you've ever been to Israel, they have elevators that just stop at every floor. And, and it's a, called the Sabbath, the Sabbath elevator. They, they make most of the elevators as a sab, the, the, the Sabbat. Um, it's a Sabbat elevator. But they also have timers that will cook the food, start the fires on the oven and stuff, and, and it will shut itself off. So they don't do it. And that's okay um, because they didn't actually work. But, you know, by the time of Christ, the Mishnah and the Talmud had over 1,500 ordinances and they were just getting ridiculous, you know. If you were to pluck a hair, you're harvesting. If you plucked a gray hair, if you looked in the mirror and you combed your hair, well, um, you know, it, it, just, it just got ridiculous. But then they figured out ways around it. If you're following a rope, you don't start counting the steps until the end of the rope. So in the Jewish community, they would have one rope go to another house, to another house, to another house. And so virtually they walked as much as they wanted in, in Israel because they, on, on, uh, you know, before sundown on Friday, they got all the ropes out and got them all connected. And, you know, it, weird, ridiculous things. But it's interesting that they believe the Mishnah, the Talmud, their, their ordinances adding to this law was as equal in importance as the law itself. And you might remember in Mark 2 when Jesus' disciples were going through a grain field and you could get the head of grain, you could rub it in your hand, the outer shell comes off and it sort of gets gummy and you can eat it and boy, talking about straight nutrition, you know, uh, from those grains, and, and they came along and said, hey, your disciples are breaking the law. They're harvesting. Even though the law says you can pick an apple. You can't pick a bucket of, a bucket of apples, but you can pick one apple and eat it. Um, but nevertheless, the Talmud had sort of undone some of the actual scriptures to, to make it even more religiously zealous, I guess. But he, he tells a story about how David didn't have any food, and the priest gave him the showbread only for the priest, that which is in the temple area, only for the priest. But they changed it out every day, and they, they were changing out the bread that usually the priest took it home. But in this case, they said, hey, David, you can have it. And, uh, and, and Jesus asked, didn't, didn't David actually break the law? Shouldn't he have been stoned to death for that? But he wasn't. Why? Because Jesus explains in Matthew chapter 2, verse 27 and 28, he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. So he is basically saying, I created it. I was there on the very first seventh day. I was in the Garden of Eden, kicking back, looking at the things, throwing, you know, putting my hand in the stream, refreshing myself there in the beauty of, of an earth without even sin on it. I created it. And you're going to tell me what it means to keep it or not to keep it? But I'm going to tell you why I made it. To be a blessing to man. So the Sabbath was to be this blessing and now man comes into that blessing. But you've switched it around. You, you've said now that, that, that it's not the Sabbath is created to bless man, but the Sabbath is this thing that man's got to fit into and not disobey God in. And, and it's just become this burden and nobody's refreshed. Nobody's blessed. Just everybody, all they can do is be cursed because 
one little thing they do is, oh, that's according to the latest law. Didn't you see the new writing in the Mishnah? <laughs> you know, rule number 1,000? You know, that you, you just broke it. You're, you're kidding. All I did was pick up a piece of glass from the cup that God broke yesterday so nobody would step on it. Yep, but that's working on the Sabbath. Ridiculous. Now, in our attitude towards the Seventh-day Adventist or the Seventh-day Baptist or others, we're, we're not to judge them. People have different cultures all over the world. And, and that's why I think there's not super specifics in the Bible on how to be married or how to raise kids, because I think it really changes with cultures. But also, I think we're all in some degree have passed baggage, good or bad, of religiousness the way we grew up in it. So whether you grew up in Catholicism or you grew up um, in, to be a Baptist or something else, to some degree, when we get in our mid-ages, we romanticize our childhood more and more, and we actually can't remember most of the bad things and only remember most of the good things, unless you were severely traumatized, and that's another case. But um, you, you, you remember them much more fondly than they actually were. <laughs> and, and so we, we do have it to some degree cultural things that we still want in our life. And it's not necessarily bad or, or religious things. It's not necessarily bad, but it's not necessarily something good either. And so he says in Romans 14, for example, there's those who are vegetarians or there, there are those who, you know, you got some ex-priests of the Diana worship and every piece of meat they ever ate was first sacrificed and given to some God. And you go into the pagan, you know, um, markets and every market, this one's to Zeus, this one's to Diana, this one's to... And so virtually, you can't buy meat that wasn't in some ways dedicated to the God when they bled it and killed it and, and then cut it up to, to sell. But, but in essence, Paul's like, hey, God made the cow. I'm hungry. Let's eat. But other people are going, hey, I'm not going to support that Zeus burger stand over there because my sister is still a prostitute in their temple. And I can't believe that you're buying something. That really bothers me. So it came down to, is it right or is it not right? And, and Paul says in, in Romans 14, receive one who is weak in the faith, not to dispute over doubtful things. For one believes he may eat all things. Another who is weak eats only vegetables. Let not him who eat despise him who does not eat. And let him who does not eat judge him who eats. For God has received him. So that's on the eating issue. Now he's going to go into the Sabbath day issue. Who are you to judge another servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day above another, another esteems every day alike. Let each one be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord. He who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord, and he who gives uh, God thanks and he who does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat and gives God thanks. For none of us lives to himself and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and rose again and lived again, rose and lives again, that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. But why do you judge your brother? Why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, as is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee should bow to him, and every tongue confess to God. It's interesting, my son is a part of a growing church in a Washington area, and they just built a brand new building, but they still can't fit everybody in it. It's, it's growing, it's a good church. So they started Thursday night, Sunday morning services, but on Thursday night, with a special emphasis on little kids, ministering to little kids in that Thursday evening study. And it's a perfect fit for my son and for their kids. It's a little smaller of a group. It's not as big as it is on Sunday, 
but uh, their kids really love it. But getting up Sunday morning and not going to church, you know, at first they felt like a you know fish out of water because he had been raised in our home. And of course, every th- Sunday morning you get up and there's this routine, there's this pattern. And, and, uh, and uh, now they, they do go Thursday night and they have a midweek Bible study they, they do also. But it, it's interesting. And uh, I knew a, a community that was a vacation village and their weekend was um, Tuesday, Wednesday. And most of the denominational churches, including the Catholic Church, had services on Wednesday. That's when they had them. Because Saturday and Sunday is the big time when all the vacationers are there. They can't have their shop closed down. And uh, and so, but it's interesting, there were some denominations like, nope, we're doing it on Sunday morning, period. Um, Because that's the Sabbath. Of course, it's not the Sabbath, is it? The Sabbath is Saturday. It's not Sunday. But there are some Christians who said, no, no, the the New Testament Sabbath is Sunday. Well, actually, Jesus points out there's a lot of work in in worshiping. And if God said worship on the seventh day, he would have said that. He didn't. He said rest. And he said you priests who are doing sacrifices on the Sabbath are actually breaking the law, but God overlooks it. But if you think about it, it wasn't a day of worship. But the idea was us on Sunday morning, that's when Christ rose from the dead. But also, we have a day of rest, and the first of our energies um, is given to God. The first day of the first week. Give to the Lord first. Give him your best. Give him the best of your life. Give him the best the first of your week. Uh, you know. So to me, I'm fully convinced Sunday morning is great. But in Brazil, and you can ask John Wang, he'll be here this Sunday morning preaching. In Brazil, the tradition of that entire country has always been you have church Sunday night. I don't, I don't know why. It probably has to do with work and people working all seven days or whatever. But it's Sunday night. But there are a few denominational churches that come in and they're going to have a Sunday morning, you know, because that's God's day and that's God's time. And, uh, of course, I I think church history and even the Bible makes it clear that's when Christians were worshiping. But I'm sure of why Paul was worshiping on Sunday, because when he would go into town, he was at the synagogues debating with the Jews that Christ is the fulfillment. He's the prophecy. So he's not going to be at church Saturday when he can be over there witnessing to the Jews on, on Saturday morning. Well, for us in the New Testament, there is no law. 1 Corinthians 6, 12, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought into the power of any. And then he says it a second time in 1 Corinthians. Boy, these Corinthians were trying to go back into legalism, weren't they? And Paul once again says, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. In Romans 10, 4, for Christ is what? The end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So Galatians 2.16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. James says, hey, there's 613 laws, and you break one of them, you're guilty of the whole law. So if you're saying I'm a keeper of the law, you're not just the Seventh-day Adventist. You're supposed to be all 613 laws, not just picking one or two of them out and, and making that your claim to fame. In Romans 3, now we know, it says in verse 19 and 20, that whatever the law says, it says those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped, all the world may become guilty before God. For by the deeds of the law, no flesh shall be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin, period. That's all the law ever was meant to do, to show that as much a sincerity of heart we want to keep it, we don't have the ability to do it consistently because we truly are sinners needing a savior. 
So Galatians 3, 24 and 25 says, yep, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ. We need a savior. I need somebody to save us. I cannot, by keeping the law or my good works, be righteous before God. He goes on to say in Galatians 3, 24, that we might be justified by faith. After faith has come, we no longer need a tutor. And this is what Colossians 2, verse 14 to 17 tells us here. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, the law, which was contrary to us, he's taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. So let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding the festival or new moon or what, guys? Sabbaths which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. So all of the feasts that they had to do, or they were cut off. They, you're 20 years old or above, you had to go to where the tabernacle was or the temple was three times a year. You had to show up, didn't matter what the circumstances was, you gotta be there for the, the law says you have to be. You have all the various laws of purification, all the various laws of ceremonial laws, all the different laws of giving and the types of giving. And then there's many different Sabbaths, weren't there? There's the seventh day, there was the seventh day Sabbath, the seventh year Sabbath, um, and, and many other Sabbaths as well that they were to obey and be a part of. So what is the substance of Christ in the Sabbath? This is where we go back to Genesis And we see that the Lord created that day. It was finished. It was ended. It was done. It was done. It was created. It was made. There was, it was emphatically nothing more to be created. Nothing more to be done. All was done by God. Man wasn't created on the third day. So then the next three days, we wonder, oh, was man helping God out on the last three days? (laughs) Man was the last of creation, wasn't he? Man was the, the fullness of man. Eve was created, okay, as we'll see, at the very end of the sixth day. Man's very first day of life was walking in to the finished work of God. And what is he supposed to do? Nothing. The law is rest and be refreshed and enjoy it with the Lord. And in um, Exodus 31, I, I I didn't mention it a minute ago, but the very last verse, verse 17 of Exodus 31 going back, This is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. On the six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth. And the seventh day, he rested and he was refreshed. (laughs) I love that. The Lord was just hanging out with Adam and Eve saying, enjoy the completed work of God. So now we come to Hebrews chapter four. And Paul explains this very doctrine. He says in verse 1 of Hebrews 4, Therefore, since the promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For he who has believed does enter that rest as he, God, had said, So I swore in my wrath, I shall not enter my rest. Although... The works were finished from the foundations of the world. Now, verse 4. For he, God, has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way. Two different things. First of all, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. Secondly, he said, and, and this is in Psalms 95, verse 10 and 11. It says, and again in this place, They, the children of Israel, shall not enter my rest. Whoa. Since therefore 
it remains that some have not, or some must enter it. And those to whom it was first preached did not enter it because of disobedience, or some translations say unbelief. I like that better, because of unbelief. Again, he designates in a certain day, saying to David, today, after such a long time as it's been said, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua, which is the same name as Jesus, right? Joshua is English. Yahshua is Hebrew. Jesus is Spanish. Jesus is Greek. So if the Old Testament Joshua had given them rest by taking them into the promised land, then he would not afterwards have spoken of another day. There remains therefore a rest from the people for the people of God. Now listen to verse 10. For he who has entered his rest, God's rest that he's speaking of, has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. Let's stop there in that verse 10 and just meditate. Who is the true believer who believes in salvation by faith alone? And that person believes that Jesus Christ on the cross, when he said, it is what? Finished. It is done. It is made. It is completed. There is nothing more you can do. There's nothing more needed. He did all the work. Now by faith, rest. Be refreshed in Christ. That's it. You'll find a rest for your soul. (laughs) Jesus said, if you come to him. But the children of Israel always kept trying to mix their faith with their own righteousness, their own works, their own law. And therefore, they never could enter into it. And now these Jewish second generation Christians, they've grown up in the Christian church in the book of Hebrews. And they're thinking about going back to Judaism because it wasn't as persecuted as, as Christianity at this point. And Paul says to them in verse 11, let therefore you be diligent, work really hard to enter into that rest. <laughs> An oxymoron, right? Lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience or unbelief. Boy, Paul talks about this so clearly in Romans 4. Soak this in, in these first four verses of Romans 4, verse 1 through 8. What then shall we say that Abraham, our father, is found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, well, he would have something to boast about, not before God. But what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, as a gift, but as a debt. But to him who does not work, emphatic here, right? To him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Just as David describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness, how? Apart from works. Do you see that in verse 5? To him who does not work but only believes is justified by faith under righteousness. David says again, the man, God imputes righteousness to him, but it only happens when it's apart from works, only as a gift. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven, whose sins are covered, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin any longer. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, you know this well. By grace you've been saved through faith, not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. I love that verse in Isaiah 30, verse 15. For thus says the Lord God, his Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest, what? You shall be saved in quietness and confidence shall be your strength. Faith to faith. When you feel like the earth is moving, are you grounded on the rock, not on the sand? What is the rock? 
It's hearing God's word and doing it. What is the word of God? The Father is speaking repeatedly in the Gospel of John. Believe in me. Believe in my Son. This is to do the works of the Father. You want to do the works of God? Believe in him whom God has sent. You've done it. So, we come to say that the day of rest, those first three verses of Genesis, like the first 11 chapters of Genesis, every major doctrine found in the entire Bible are found in those first 11 chapters. And this is the one, we see it right away. It's that the definition of faith alone in the work of God alone as a gift of God by grace and love and mercy and kindness. This is his nature. It's not us adding to it. It's not us in our worry, looking at our sinful condition, saying, God, I'll try harder. I'll do better. Don't, don't cut me off. Don't throw me away. You know, but by faith to rest. Yes, I'm in your hand. Yeah, I'm a lemon. I hear you, devil. I am a lemon. But God picked me. He wants some lemonade, I guess. Yeah, I am a loser. Yes, I am a sinner. But Christ isn't listening to your condemnation. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Nothing. Nobody can bring accusations against you because you are God's child. And we, by faith, are just sitting next to Jesus at rest, being refreshed, finding rest for our souls, not of our righteousness, not of our works, but by faith alone in him and his work. Amen? Well, any thoughts or, convert, any thoughts or uh, comments? Just if anybody wants to know, that sermon was in 36 and a half minutes. <laughs> Stopwatch, I'm getting better. Any, any thoughts or comments, questions? Well, come on up, Matthias. Sometimes when you teach so thoroughly, we just all sit in awe. We just sit in awe, just going, wow. Let's have a... You can leave my microphone on either way. Yeah. Is there anybody... Um, have a couple of people start and just open up in prayer right now.